All right, what's up, guys? I probably the most asked question to date that I've gotten has been about how to address cellular respiration. So believe it or not, today I'm not even gonna give you a question. Today I'm just gonna go over the fundamentals of cellular respiration. And I know there are tons of videos out there, like Khan Academy, that have videos about it. But the thing that makes this different is over the next, I don't know how long it's gonna be, but I will give you pretty much everything you will ever know. I know Khan Academy has like six, seven videos on respiration. I'm gonna boil that all down into the basics that you will need for the MCAT that show up almost 99.99% .99 of the time. So hopefully it'll be a great way for you to make sure you address every aspect of cellular respiration. And with that, you will be address, able to address all questions that come up about cellular respiration. So obviously before we start, make sure you understand this equation is the one that's responsible for cellular respiration. glucose plus oxygen yields carbon dioxide and water. It's an oxidation reaction, and in the process, you get energy out. This entire process happens in three steps. And so now I wanna talk about what those three steps are, okay? And for this, I'm gonna give you a foolproof formula, all right? Every step of cellular respiration is listed on the right here. So actually, I lied. I said it was three steps, it's actually four. But we're gonna go over each of these steps. But if you know all four of these steps, and know these three things that I'm going to talk about on the side. You see one, two, and three. You are golden, okay? So first of all, there's glycolysis we're going to go over. Then there's pyruvate decarboxylation, citric acid cycle, and the electron transport chain. But for each of these four steps, you should know these three main things. You should know the location it happens, okay? Where does glycolysis happen? Where does pyruvate decarboxylation happen? All of that stuff. The other thing you should know is what goes in and what comes out, all right? What goes into glycolysis and what comes out? Don't worry about memorizing every enzyme. Don't worry about memorizing every substrate, every um, intermediate. No need. You just need to know what goes in and what comes out. And the last thing that you need to know is the amount of ATP or NADH, uh, and I believe there's FADH2, and sometimes you'll have carbon dioxide. So if you can know what, how much ATP, NADH, FADH2 is produced in all of these, you're going to be golden. All right? So again... These three things, if you can tell me these three things on the right, left about each of these four processes on the right, you are foolproof um, for the MCAT. Glycolysis is the most fundamental process that happens in every cell, and it's actually highlighted here. And the cool part about it is any cell, any cell on this planet that you find has been shown to undergo glycolysis. And because it is such a fundamental metabolic process, it happens in a place that is readily accessible to all cells, the cytoplasm because any cell has to have a cytoplasm, and therefore, any cell usually can undergo glycolysis. And so that's the first thing you'll need to know. Second thing is the input and output. Uh, the input into glycolysis is, well, you're starting with glucose, right? Uh, you, we know respiration starts with glucose, and because glycolysis is the first step of respiration, we have to have glucose. And the output, now this is gonna be a bit tricky, but you should know the output is two pyruvate molecules. And another thing I'm gonna point out is respiration becomes really easy to understand when you start counting your carbons, all right? So let's make sure we understand glucose is a six carbon sugar, and therefore if you end up having two equivalent sugars that come out of it, both of these have to be three carbons each, just because of the conservation of carbons, right? Um, and so that's glycolysis, the inputs and outputs. And now you don't need to know really anything in the middle here, don't worry about it. Uh, and But the last thing you'll need to know is the NADH, FADH, ATP, and CO2. Well, the thing about glycolysis is that there's no CO2 produced. We haven't produced any CO2 yet. Notice that our carbons are all still intact. However, uh, one thing you may know is you produce two NADHs in glycolysis, and it's kind of mentioned down here. But if you didn't know that, you can memorize it, or eventually you'll see that I have a way that I remember things, but we'll go over that. The other thing is zero FADH2s are producing glycolysis, and you also have two net ATP produced. All right, I'm gonna make sure you understand this is net and not two actual. There's four actual produced, but there's two invested initially, so you have four net overall. So that's all you need to know about glycolysis, like honestly. If I were to rate the number of things that get asked about glycolysis, it usually has to do about with these three things. Sometimes you'll get asked about phosphofructokinase as an enzyme, but really, if you know these three things, you're already doing really well. Okay. So now, remember, remember at the end of glycolysis, we end with pyruvate, and pyruvate is shown on this picture. I'm circling it um, on this picture as well. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to get this pyruvate, which was in the cytosol, because remember, it happens in the cytosol, the um, glycolysis. We need to decarboxylate it. 
and we're going to decarboxylate it. As you're going to see, it's going to get decarboxylated as it ends go as it goes into the mitochondrial matrix. So the answer to the location is matrix of mitochondria, right? Um, and so this pyruvate. Another thing is you may not know what pyruvate decarboxylation is, but let's be intuitive for a second. Decarboxylation. What the heck does decarboxylation mean? Well, when you desegregate something, you take the segregation out. And carboxyl is just a C double O. And so what you're going to mean is you're losing CO2. Right? You're losing CO2. So for every pyruvate that goes in, the input is pyruvate because that's the output of, respir uh, of glycolysis. But the output here is acetyl-CoA. And another way I remember that is acetic acid. Acetic acid is two carbons, so acetyl-CoA is also two carbons. Uh, and pyruvate, remember, is three carbons. So right away, you can tell that we must have lost a CO2 molecule. And this is the great part about being intuitive. If you just count carbons, you will see where the CO2 goes. All right. Another thing is uh, we're going to go through this list now. If you look at this diagram at the top, you'll see that in pyruvate decarboxylation, you actually produce one NADH, um, you produce no FADH2s, you produce no ATPs, and but you do produce, again, one CO2. You lose one CO2 so that when you exhale, that CO2, one of one sixth of those is coming from this pyruvate decarboxylation process. All right, so now let's move on to the more hefty part of this lecture, uh, which is the citric acid cycle. It's also known as the tricarboxylic acid cycle, which is abbreviated TCA, and some people also know it as, as the Krebs cycle. Knowing all three names will be in your benefit because they can be call it anything. Um, all right, so remember, the location is, well, we're already in the matrix of the mitochondria, so why not just stay there? Uh, the location of the citric acid cycle is matrix of the mitochondria. But, again, always know the inputs and outputs, you'll know that the input is acetyl-CoA, right? Because that's what we made in this diagram at the top right shows you that acetyl-CoA is our starting point. But what is the output? Well, again, the citric acid cycle is a cycle. So you may be confused with what the output is because what when you put something in it, it should get regenerated. And you will be, you're right, because what's going to happen initially is acetyl-CoA will join with acetate to form citric acid, which is why it's called the citric acid cycle, because citric acid is the first thing formed. But the point is, over the long term, every carbon in acetyl-CoA gets released as CO2. Okay, And remember, just so we're clear here, for every glucose molecule, there's two acetyl-CoA's, and therefore you do this cycle twice. Um, so everything I'm mentioning to you has to be doubled if you wanted to take one glucose into consideration. So um, remember, the input is acetyl-CoA into the citric acid cycle, but the output is that those acetyl-CoA molecules, the carbons in those acetyl-CoA, will be lost as carbon dioxide. All right, so for one glucose molecule, we have two acetyl-CoA's, right? Acetyl-CoA. And because we have two acetyl-CoA's, everything in this cycle that is produced will get multiplied by two. So you'll see that in this cycle, we produce three NADHs. So if we wanted to take one glucose, that would mean two, two acetyl-CoA's, then we would have six NADHs, right? And now we go to FADH2's, and you'll see that there actually is one FADH2 produced, but we're doing the cycle twice, so there's two FADH's. Do you guys see how intuitive this is for me? You have to follow a very logical sense here, okay? And now we have to see how many de novo ATPs are made. There's a GTP here, but that uh, the GTP ends up eventually becoming an ATP. So for all intents and purposes, there's two ATPs because you end up going through the, the cycle twice. And last but not least, well, how many CO2s are released? Well, now this is the tricky part because we had our glucose molecule, right? And in our last step, we lost one carbon dioxide from our glucose molecule. But, but, but. But here's the tricky part. We actually ended up doing this twice, right? Because we had one pyruvate go through pyruvate decarboxylation, you lose one carbon dioxide, and then we lose another carbon dioxide because the second pyruvate does the same thing. So technically, we only have four carbons left from our original glucose, and all four of them are lost in the citric acid cycle. So majority of the CO2 you exhale, another great MCAT question, where does most of the CO2 you exhale come from? It comes from the citric acid cycle, all right? And so this is just all the numbers for one glucose molecule. And now, last but not least, we are on to the electron transport chain. I show a picture here first just because it's a very intricate process. 
the NADHs that we've produced so far and the FADH2s we've produced so far are going to drop off their electrons here and those electrons will be used to generate uh, energy in the form of ATP. How is this energy made? Well, now let's analyze it. Where is the location of the electron transport chain? Well, the location is the mitochondrial membrane, the inner mitochondrial membrane. Because remember, where was the citric acid cycle? The citric acid cycle was in the matrix. So where, what membrane is the closest to the matrix? The inner mitochondrial membrane is the closest. Remember, biology is not stupid. Biology does very intuitive things. And in this case, biology wants to use a membrane for the electron transport chain, and the closest membrane is the inner mitochondrial membrane. Okay. And now here's the other thing. What is the input and the output? Well, the inputs are always NADHs and FADH2s because those are our energy electron carriers. They have electrons on them. They drop off their electrons and therefore the output ends up being NAD plus, uh, FAD, oh, that looks bad, but FAD uh, plus as well. And then the um, last thing is I'd say ATP is also made, so that's an output, okay? So those are the main things that are made here. Um, the other thing that might be difficult for you to understand is which, as those electrons are dropped off, as the, let me go back to this image. As those electrons are dropped off, we pump protons across the membrane. And as you pump those protons across, they eventually come back down this thing called ATP synthase and generate energy. And this ATP synthase is a rotor that generates AA energy. And the cool part about it is sometimes people get asked, what direction does the proton come down? And what direction is the ATP made? And it's always hard to remember that they're pumped from the intermembrane space into the matrix. And the way I always remember it is because if you were a, a mitochondria, where would you want most of your ATP? Would you want your ATP to be in the intermembrane space? Hell no. There's no reason why you want ATP there, right? Most of the stuff is happening in the matrix. You have beta oxidation in the matrix. You have the citric acid cycle in the matrix. So why not make the ATP in the matrix? So the protons are pumped across and then they come back down into the matrix and they form the ATP in the matrix. So that's how I kind of reason that, you know, the protons are pumped from the matrix to the membrane space and then eventually come back down to have synthesize the ATP that we're talking about. Um, okay, so those are inputs and outputs and the amount of ATP produced. Well, this, let's do this for one glucose molecule, okay? If you wanted to do the math for one glucose molecule, which I'm sure you have all done, but let's be precise here. If you go through everything I've done so far, everything properly, you'll see that we have a total of 10 NADHs produced. That's a lot for one glucose molecule because we had two here. Let me even break it down for you. I'll be nice, right? We had two from glycolysis, right? We actually had uh, two from pyruvate decarboxylation, right? Because uh, we go through that process twice. And I believe we ended up having six from the citric acid cycle. And so when you add those up, that's 10. And how many FADH2s do we have? Well, we had two FADH2s just from the citric acid cycle, right? Uh, and so that's that's important. Two here and two here. And how many ATPs in general have we already produced? Well, we've already produced, remember, we already produced two from glycolysis, and then we had uh, another two in the citric acid cycle. So we had four total. And now we had all these stored ATPs and FADH2s and NADHs. The general belief is that each NADH can make about three ATPs, which means that would mean 30 ATPs from uh, NADH. And then the belief is that every FADH2s can make two ATPs. So that's four ATPs from FADH2. So when you add this all up, you get 30 plus four plus four, you get 38 total ATPs, which is a pretty good estimate. All right, and did you see that? I've done, I've, I kid you not, I have not looked at a single note this entire presentation. I have used the images to guide me, and I'm showing you how you can intuitively think about respiration. And believe it or not, in the in the fifth, I don't know, even know, I think this will be 14 minutes long. In the 14 minutes I spent showing you all of this, you've covered 99% of what may be asked of you in in the MCAT of cellular respiration. So with that, I hope you find this helpful. Uh, we just literally broke this down, this entire diagram down. I usually, uh, students love it when you can break something down in a relatively short amount of time. I hope you find this helpful. Uh, I know this is much longer than a normal video, but it's much more useful than the six, seven part series that Khan Academy has, because that's a lot of information. It may overwhelm you, but this is nice, concise, consolidated, and I hope you find it helpful. I'll see you in the next video. In the video, really appreciate it. You want to check out
any of my other videos, there's going to be one right here. Another link to one of my videos right here. And another video right here. Why not? I'll put one video right over here. And last but not least, if you want to subscribe to this channel, really appreciate it because I'm still an early YouTuber trying to get it down. But a subscription button should be right over here. So please subscribe. Cool. Thanks. See you guys in the next one. Hope you find these videos helpful.